Hi, welcome back to 5-Minute Physics. Today I'd like to pick up on something I talked about a while earlier, virtual particles, which have changed our picture of the nature of empty space, which is a boy now a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence um, on timescales so short we can't measure them. Uh, but I've t mentioned that virtual particles have an indirect effect, which was to affect the uh, energy level spacing in atoms in a way we could calculate, and that's one of the reasons we now know they exist. But virtual particles have had a much bigger effect in another sense. In fact, have affected the direction of elementary particle physics, searching for what may be a fundamental theory or a theory of everything, depending upon the hyperbole that you read at the time. But the, the, they affect it in a well-known, in a, in, a, in a direct way, which is important and I want to talk about today. And it's pretty, it's not, it's pretty straightforward, I hope. Um, but I've written some things down again so that, so that I wouldn't have to write so much while I was, while I was talking. So let, this is electromagnetism. And the electromagnetic force between two electrons is a force or repulsion, as you know. And the form of it is, is that it's some constant times a, this charge on one electron times the charge on another electron over R squared. Many of you remember this from high school. Now, we actually parameterize the strength of the electromagnetic force as being uh, something called, due to something called the fine structure constant, the fine structure constant, which is basically um, uh, the charge on the electron squared over 4 pi in some set of units, okay? We, and since we often call the charge on the electron E, E squared over 4 pi is the way I remember it. And it is a famous number that most of us in the field remember. It's 1 over 137. So 137 has a spe special uh, value for those of us in, in the field. Um, it's 1 over the, 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 uh, the fine structure constant. Okay, so that's the strength of the, of the electric force. Fine. But what we've come to realize, and perhaps which has changed our picture of the world more than anything else, is that, uh, that the forces in nature uh, and the, uh, actually change with scale. That there's no, that electromagnetism has no universal strength over all scales. The strength of electromagnetism changes over scales, not just because of this one over R squared thing, but the strength of the actual, the magnitude of an electric charge actually changes. The magnitude of the charge on the electron, the fine structure constant, which is one of the most important constants in nature, and this is the, the, the this charge on the electron is measured very, very far away from the electron. Now what we realize that when we measure the charge on the electron far away, sure, we measure this value. But if we think about what's happening due to virtual particles, as I've talked about earlier, virtual particles are popping in and out of existence all the time. And say electron-positron pairs, and lots of electron-positron pairs are popping in and out of existence at any instant around the electron. And, um, and what, what's happening is that if you're measuring the charge very far away from the electron, what you're really measuring is the charge on the electron surrounded by a cloud of virtual particles, and the positrons, which have opposite charge to the electrons, want to hang around the electron. And so what you're seeing from far away um, is actually uh, 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 the electron shielded to some extent by the, by the, by the um, uh, uh, positrons and the virtual particles that are around the electron. So actually, the charge on the electron, and this, the alpha, if you wish, um, which, uh, which, and I'm going to draw it as 1 over distance here, which is proportional to the energy at which I measure things. This is 1 over distance. So this is very small distances. This is very large distances. So if I put alpha to be 1 over 137 here at very large distances, alpha actually increases with scale. If I measure the, because, because if I measure the electron closer in, I've now gone inside that cloud of, of positrons that was shielding it. So actually, the fundamental strength of electromagnetism changes with scale. This was actually recognized a long time ago, but perhaps not the importance of it recognized until the other forces in nature were looked at. Because um, really, the next major development was a development that I've also talked about to some extent, and, and really revolutionized our thinking of the other, one of the other forces in nature, the strong force called quantum chromodynamics, the force between quarks. Now, the force between quarks is very, very strong, so, so much so that, in fact, if we try and measure the force between quarks, it appears to increase with distance, and it would take an infinite amount of energy to pull two quarks apart. This is a phenomenon called a confinement, which, for which we don't have a direct 
ability to calculate theoretically because the force is so strong that the mathematical approximations we normally use in physics break down. But, all est but, but every time you try and numerically do this, you find that the force increases with distance and, um, and, uh, this, uh, the, and, and quarks are confined. We certainly have never seen free quarks, and this, this idea explains one of the reasons we've never seen free quarks. But the big development in 1972 was the realization that, well, if the electromagnetic force changes with scale, maybe the strong force will change with scale, and we can calculate it. And, of course, around quarks, there are virtual quark-antiquark -quark pairs, a cloud of them appearing, which you might think makes the strong force change the same way as the electromagnetic force and get stronger as you get closer to a quark. But it turns out in the strong force, there are particles like photons, called gluons, that are also that also appear and, and, and disappear, just like photons do. But photons, the, the, the quantum electromagnetic radiation, have no charge. But these gluons turn out to have a charge under this colored force, as it's called. And the fact that gluons can pop in and out of existence and are charged, because they have charges, basically, and I'll put pluses all over here, this means when you look at the, a quark from very far away, you're looking at a cloud uh, of not ju just the quark charge, but the quark surrounded by gluons, and the gluons effectively make the quark charge appear bigger at, at strong distances. So this means as you get closer and closer and closer into the quark, you permeate this gluon cloud, and you find that the, that the, that the, the, um, the, the uh, charge on the quark actually, as measured, gets smaller. And here's the graph here. In fact, this is a measured graph. Now, the reason I've, 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 I've done it as a function of energy and one over distance is because we actually measure this as accelerators. We, we bang quarks into each other, basically at accelerators, and measure the strength of the force between them. And, um, and for uh, now, large distances are, are, are small energies, and small distances are large energies because, in fact, you, take, you have to... Uh, um, bang together particles with much more energy to probe smaller and smaller distances. And so um, what we've measured, and this is my representation of the actual data points, the numbers are right, is a, at about five times the energy of a proton, the strength of the uh, strong force alpha strong is one, as opposed to one over 137 for the electromagnetic force. So you can see how much stronger the strong force is. And it goes down to less than one-tenth by the time we're up near the Large Hadron Collider. So this has been measured. This phenomena of the strong force getting weaker was called asymptotic freedom. I mentioned it earlier when I talked about those, that Nobel Prize. The fact that the strong force gets weaker with high energies was what had surprised people in the 1970s, and the prediction of that in the 1970s won the Nobel Prize in 2004. So this, is, this phenomena of the strong force getting weaker, asymptotic freedom, the electromagnetic force gets stronger as you go up in energy. And therefore, that leads you to suspect if, the, if electromagnetism, which is much weaker than the strong force, gets stronger, and the strong force gets weaker, maybe the forces of nature can get unified. And um, this led, in the 1970s, to the idea of what's been called grand unification. And I've, tr I've pre-drawn this so I could get the numbers roughly correct. I now draw one over the strength of the force, so that the electromagnetic force at, at, at zero energy or, very, or, or large distance is, is 137, okay? Because that could allow me to normalize it. So one over the strong force. So the, the electromagnetic force gets stronger, which means one over the strong, electromagnetic force gets weaker. The strong force gets weaker, which means one over the strong force gets larger. And it turns out the weak force in the strong model, which is the other one of the three forces, also gets stronger. And the idea, and, and this was, this was uh, when this was developed, a particle called LEP at, in Geneva was just developed, which was running a, uh, a, an accelerator at, at 100 GeV, 100 times the energy available in protons, uh, which are 1 GeV. And the idea, the thought was, well, look, we've measured the forces. One's getting weaker, the other's getting stronger, the other's getting stronger. Maybe they unify together. But then, over time... And this is, this is the scale we've now been able to probe at accelerators at the Large Hadron Collider, about two, uh, 10 tera electron volts, much bigger than LEP. And we've seen these, these forces evolve, but now we can measure them much better. 
having having this lever arm, and originally it was thought maybe they came together at a single point, but it's now realized in the standard model they don't come together in a single point. And this was one of the motivations to suggest that maybe there was something new in nature, a new symmetry of nature that might produce new particles around the scale that might be measured in the Large Hadron Collider. And theoretical predictions with this theory called the minimal supersymmetric standard model it involved a new symmetry of nature called supersymmetry, suggested, well, if a whole bunch of new particles are, 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 exist at, a, at an energy scale that we can only probe at the Large Hadron Collider, then they'll affect the virtual particle calculations that will change the nature of the forces. But because they're very massive, they'll be only, uh, the, those virtual particles will only be relevant at very small scales. And they'll change the, what we call the running of the coupling constants. And when that was plugged in, this theory called the minimal supersymmetric standard model was plugged in before we could measure anything at the Large Hadron Collider. And when you plugged it in, it turned out magically all the forces came together at a scale of uh, energy scale of something like 16 orders of magnitude more energetic than the energy associated with a proton, or 16 orders of magnitude in distance scale smaller than the size of, of, a, of, a, of a proton. And that led to the, the, to the realization that maybe there were, that grand unification, as it became called, grand unified theories, might be related to supersymmetry. Now, two things have come in since then. We also realize that gravity is getting much weaker, so maybe all the forces in nature unify at a scale of a, of, of the, called the Planck scale, which is about 19 orders of magnitude and energy greater than that available to the, to the proton. And that's led to, of course, ultimately to string theory and lots of other ideas. But one of the stumbling blocks that's now come in is now we've actually measured things at the Large Hadron Collider, and we haven't seen any of these new particles yet. And this is a problem. Now, it doesn't rule out the theory, but the fact that we haven't seen any of these new particles suggests maybe that this idea has to be modified. But the idea of grand unification is so compelling because the forces are getting closer and closer together that, that people still think maybe there's some way they can be unified. But all of this notion that there was a grand unified theory, which then led to the idea of maybe a theory of everything that brought gravity in, all of these ideas came from the existence of virtual particles, which changed the strengths of the forces in nature. And that's really a profound difference, because in, when I was a student or, 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 or an undergraduate, we all, I, I tend to, th to think that there was a theory, a fundamental theory of electromagnetism, which was the same at all scales, and the strong force between quarks, which is the same at all scales. Now we realize that the forces of nature themselves evolve with scale, and when we talk about a force, we have to associate the scale with it. The laws of nature evolve with scale because of the nature of virtual particles. Okay. Have a, good, uh, have a good rest of the week, and hopefully I'll keep trying to whittle these things down so they're a little bit shorter.